Take your Bibles, turn to the book of Exodus, please. The book of Exodus, chapter number 5. Exodus, chapter number 5. When you find your place, you can stand with us, please. Exodus chapter number five. I love the story of, of uh, how God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. It's a, it's a very uh, amazing story. It's a powerful story. There's a statement that we find right here in the midst of all of this drama that's taken place when... Uh, God was delivering the nation of Israel, or about to, through his servant Moses. You know the story. He appeared to Moses at a burning bush. The bush was not consumed in chapter 3. God told Moses, take your shoes off for the place where thou standest is holy ground. And then God commissioned Moses to be the one, the deliverer, to go and to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. He'd been in slavery and bondage for 400 years under under Egyptian rule, under Pharaoh's rule. And so Moses finally uh, surrendered to God's will and went to do what God called him to do. And the Bible tells us that, uh, my mic, is my mic cutting out? Is it messing up? If it is, let me know. I'll grab the handheld, okay? Uh, it messed up a little bit on Wednesday night, and we bought a new, a new one. But uh, just wave at me real big, Brother Kevin, if it starts to mess up, all right? And uh, we'll just try to uh, keep this thing going here. But anyway, so he's standing before uh, uh, Moses, is standing before Pharaoh, and is about to break the news to him that he's about to lose all of his free slave labor. <laughs> and, uh, of course, Pharaoh didn't take too kindly to that. And that's where we pick up in the story here in Exodus chapter number 5. The Bible says in verse number 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in, and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God. Give me that black mic, or that black mic right there. Let's just not even let the devil. The devil's going to try his best to just hold that for just a second. I'm all tied up here. I have to get ready. Even the baseball pitchers get a few warm-up pitches. Amen. Let's put that up under there. All right, here we go. I feel like I feel like Benny Hinn with his handheld mic right here. Amen. Hopefully it'll be better. Exodus 5, verse 1. Are we there? Yes, Bible says, Afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Look at verse 2. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go? Boy, when I read that question there, Pharaoh asked, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I thought, my, what a loaded question. It would only take about two or three or four lifetimes to even begin to answer that question. But I'm gonna to try to do it this morning in three hours, all right? So stay with me. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in church grateful, Lord, for a place to come. Bring my family where I know, Lord, that we can meet with God and hear the voice of God and, and have the Holy Spirit speaking and working in our heart. Now, I pray that you give me liberty to preach. I pray that you give me clarity of thought and may the people of God have liberty to listen this morning. And Lord, whatever it is that you want to do and need to do, we pray that you'd have complete liberty to do that. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I just want to preach for a few minutes on that thought. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Now, if you know anything at all about ancient Egypt and Pharaoh, you know that in those days, they had many, many different false gods. I mean, they had a whole list of them. Don, you can sit down right over there, big guy. And, and so we see in, the, in, in, the history, in, in history tells us they had a lot of false gods. They had a lot of false idols. They had different people and things and animals and concepts that the Egyptian people looked at as being divine, that they revered, that they worshipped. And uh, so when 
when Moses comes over here to, to Pharaoh and begins to say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, this was a God that Pharaoh had never heard of. And I imagine that part of him was just a little bit confused how that he could be in the position that he was in as the ruler of then the known world pretty much and have missed, somehow missed out on who this God was that, that uh, Moses is referring to. But I want to notice a couple of things by way of introduction uh, in this passage of scripture and we see here that God is introduced to Pharaoh in verse number one. Moses went in and told Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Now, Moses was already apprehensive about taking this message to Pharaoh. He already knew what Pharaoh was going to say. Because if you'll remember back in chapter number three, when he's standing at the burning bush, he said to God, he said, who am I going to tell them sent me? In chapter three, and uh, verse number 13, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me to you, they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thou, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Moses said, Even the children of Israel is going to wonder where I'm getting my authority. They're going to want to know who gave me my marching orders and now here he's standing before Pharaoh and he says, the Lord God of Israel hath said, let my people go. Pharaoh's first question was, who is the Lord? I've heard of all these other gods. I've heard of all these other uh, beings, all these other deities as they referred to them. But I have never heard of one called the Lord. Who is the Lord? Well, he's about to get an answer. He's about to find out over the next few chapters just who it was he was dealing with here. But I want to say this this morning. There may be somebody sitting in this service that when they hear that this is what the Lord wants you to do, that either verbally or mentally they will say something like this. Well, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And you may find yourself being a little bit like Pharaoh, where Pharaoh said in the latter part of verse number two, I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I don't know this God. I don't know who he thinks he is, but I do know this, that I'm not gonna do what he's telling me to do. Now there's a lot of people that has that attitude. They really wouldn't just come right out and say it. I mean, it sounds a lot worse when you verbalize it than it does when you just think it. But there's a lot of people that are thinking it. I know I'm not doing what he said for me to do. I know what the Bible says. I don't know uh, 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 who that preacher is to think he's going to stand up there on that pulpit and tell me how I'm supposed to live and what I'm supposed to do. I don't know who God is, and I know I'm not doing what he wants me to do. You might need a good message this morning on just who the Lord is. I'm going to give you three points, just three. Three reasons this morning why we need to know who he is, we need to know what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with and why we ought to listen to him when he speaks. Are you ready? Number one, write this down. The Lord the, that Pharaoh's asking about in verse two, who is the Lord? Number one, the Lord is the creator of all men. I mean, for no other reason we ought to listen to him because he created us and he made us. Revelation 4, 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I just want to let you know something this morning in case you hadn't got the memo. You didn't evolve from a monkey. A little girl asked her mother one time, she said, Mama, where did the human race appear? Where did we come from? And she said, God made Adam and Eve and they had children, and they had children, and they had children. That's where the human race came from. That's where we came from. A few days later, the little girl asked her daddy, said, Daddy, where did we come from? And she, he said, many years ago, there were apes and monkeys. And that's where we came from. 
Well, she made a beeline to her mother, and she said, I'm confused. She said, I asked you where we came from, and you said God created us. I asked Daddy where he came from, where we came from, and he said that uh, we came from monkeys. And the mama said, well, dear, I told you about my side of the family, and he told you about his. My daddy used to say this. He said, I had some of my ancestors that probably swung from their necks, but none of them swung from their tail. Amen. But in 18, in 1859, in November of 1859, Charles Darwin wrote a book called The Origin of the Species. The actual title, that's the abbreviated version, the actual title is The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And it was there where the concept of evolution originated. And ever since that book came out, people have been grasping to the false religion of evolution as an attempt to try to explain man's existence without God's existence. It's a way for them to justify living ever how they want to live and eliminate the whole idea of accountability to a, 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 a higher being or a, a higher calling or a, a, to a God. And, 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 and it is a religion because it takes a whole lot more faith to believe evolution than it does to believe the Bible. Somebody asked a science teacher one time, said, do you, do, do you really believe? I mean, are you so dumb as to really believe that, 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 that God spoke the word and that we all just came from Adam? And he said, well, you think we came from a rock. You think we came from a rock. I mean, that's the, the, the big bang theory requires an enormous amount of faith. Because I promise you this morning, if we were to set off a pallet of C4 in this building and stand back and watch the Big Bang, pretty sure when we came back, things would be worse off than they were when we left them. Big Bangs do not create things. Big Bangs destroy things. A lot of people struggling over their idea of who God is. Who is the Lord? I tell you who he is. He's the creator of all men is the creator of all things. One day a zookeeper noticed an orangutan in his cage. He had the origin of species in one hand and he had a Bible in the other. And the zookeeper asked the orangutan, he said, man, what are you doing? Why are you reading those two books? He said, well, I'm just trying to figure out am I my brother's keeper or am I my keeper's brother? And that's about the truth. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Well, number one, he's your creator. And he created you. David said this. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works that my soul knoweth right well. Psalm 139, verse number 14. You know what God said in Isaiah chapter number 50, uh, 45 and in verse number 9. Here's what God said. Listen carefully. God said in verse, in verse 9 of Isaiah 45, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Woe to him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Shall the clay say to the potter, Who are you? What are you doing? Let no man strive with his maker. Well, I believe that would describe a lot of people today. In fact, let's just be honest, that would describe most people today. Striving with their maker. God created you. You might look in the mirror and not be real impressed. I'm looking at some of you this morning and I'm equally unimpressed. But you are fearfully and wonderfully made and created in the image of Almighty God for a purpose and for a reason. One of the worst things I hear people say is sometimes they say, my parents told me that I was a mistake. I've heard my parents say I, I, that you were an accident. We weren't trying to have you. What a terrible thing to say to a child. And though your mom and daddy may not have planned on you, God Almighty planned on you and he loves you 
and he made you and he created you. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Pharaoh, you're created by God. That's why you ought to do what he said. That's why you ought to comply with his will. Boy, I wish I had time to preach that a little bit longer. But number two, write this down. Man said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Number one, that God is the creator of all men. But number two, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Write this down. The Lord is the savior of all men. You know what's so amazing to me about this God, this big God, this powerful God. And I listened to that song again this morning that the the clouds are the dust of his feet. What a big God. He spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke the galaxies into existence, the planets and the sun and the moon and the stars. And I just love the way it says that in Genesis chapter number one, that he created the sun and the moon. Oh, and the stars also. Just kind of just kind of flung those out there like putting sprinkles on a cupcake. Just made the stars also. I mean, he's a big God. But not only is he the creator, but he's, he's big enough and loves us enough that he created a way for us to be able to interact with him. He's the savior. He looked down, saw a sinful man. Looked down and saw sinful man. And as they say down south, he just said, bless their heart. We were so far away. We were so incapable of being able to reach him. We were in the muck and the mire of this world. Ephesians 2 says we were dead in trespasses and sin. I mean, we were bad off. Do you remember, remember where you were before you got saved? People probably gave up on you. People probably told you you'd never be anything, you'd never amount to anything because of the decisions you made, the choices you made. And the devil had chewed you up and spit you out. But the God that created the worlds, the God that created you, the God that created me, created a bridge to separate that divide between God and man. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Listen to me carefully this morning. For those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, He is our Savior. But guess what? If you reject Him, He's still your Savior. That's right. He bought and paid for. He bought and paid for your forgiveness. He bought and paid for your eternal life. He bought and paid for your redemption. You just have to accept it and receive it. Somebody gave us some tickets one time to something, to an, to an event. And I'm sure it was expensive because they were very proud of themselves for giving it to us. It really wasn't something that I would have chosen to do or chosen to go, but it was free. And sometime later, my wife said to me, she said, where are those tickets? I said, I don't know. I've looked everywhere for those tickets. I can't find them. Somebody bought them. Somebody paid for them. They're not doing me any good until I take it and present it at the, at the gate. Is everybody still with me? Anybody in here ever got a gift card for your birthday and lost it? Ain't that terrible? That's worse than losing money. I hate it when I lose a gift card. Somebody gave me a gift card one time and it had like $2.10 on it. I think they had a gift card and they bought everything they could and they had a little bit on it and so they put it in a birthday card and gave it to me. You're standing there at the cash register with a whole bunch of stuff, you're like, man, I hit the jackpot and they swiped the card and it's like, there's $2.10. I was like, man, they didn't love me very much. I'm telling you though, the gift he gave us yeah. worth a whole lot more than $2.10. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He paid my sin debt every sin that I have ever committed he washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ who is the Lord that I should obey his voice I tell you who he is he's the savior of all men
when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He looked down and saw me in my condition and realized I could not save myself. You know, I don't understand why so many religions and so many denominations and all these cults, they teach you can work your way to heaven. Are you kidding me? I mean, do you honestly think that you can live long enough to earn a mansion in heaven? It's going to take you 30 years to pay for that house you're living in. You know I'm telling the truth. It's going to take you 30 years to pay for that dump that you live in. You think you can live long enough to earn a mansion in heaven? You can't live long enough. You can't do enough good. You can't save yourself. You were, you were in a mess and you couldn't get yourself out. So he looked down and had compassion and said, I'm going to get you out of that mess. You can't, you can't get yourself out. So here's what God did. Stay with me now. This is fixing to get real deep. I'm going to get up here because it's going to get deep. You ready? He became sin for us. Who knew no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. John chapter number one starts out like this. In the beginning was the Word. Capitalized W. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I bumped into a young man in, in the Philippines. We were there on that Saturday. We had all those children. We were doing that children's ministry. And they were preaching and they were teaching and singing songs with them and teaching them Bible verses. And there was a young man walked up, clean cut young man, sharp looking guy. Had a little backpack on his back. He walked up, he introduced himself. And he, had, he said, I, I, I'm Church of Christ. Well, we have Church of Christ here in America. So I'm a little bit familiar with the Church of Christ. There's a lot of things that we have in common that we believe, but there's a couple of things that we disagree on. And so I just made a mental note that this guy believes this and this and this. And then he hands me a magazine, reaches in his backpack, hands me a magazine. And I begin to thumb through this magazine. Man, there was more red flags than a Chinese parade. I said, something's wrong here. And I said to him, I said, uh, let me see if I understand you correctly. I mean, it didn't take me but about 30 seconds of just glancing through this magazine, see all the error and the false doctrine. I said, let me see if I understand you correctly. You don't believe Jesus was God? He said, oh, no, Jesus never said he was God. Woo, okay. I said, do you not believe in the Trinity? No, I don't believe in the Trinity. The Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. We don't believe that. So then you don't believe the Bible. <laughs> and I started, I took my Bible out, and I began to just show him some verses. Verses that would convince a three-year-old. You can't get much better than Isaiah 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born. A prophecy about the birth of Jesus. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I said, who's it talking about? Man, he was just obstinate. I took him over to Hebrews chapter number 1 where it says, Under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. I took him over to Titus chapter number 2 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I took him over to Philippians 2 where it says he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. The Bible says that he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I took him over to John 17. I and my father are one. I mean, good. Night alive. How many verses do you need? He didn't believe it. And I spent about five minutes with him. Six, seven minutes with him. And I said to him, I said, you know what? I don't have time to fool you. And Brother Arvin was there. And Brother Arvin said, I've been trying to help this guy. I said, he don't want help. 
I said, he shows up over here on a Saturday when there's 300 kids that need to get saved and he's nothing but a tool of Satan to be a distraction to what you're trying to do. I said, best thing you do this guy is tell him to take a hike and leave him alone. He's not interested in the truth. All he's gonna do is interfere and confuse your new converts. You need to cut this man loose. I said, preacher, that's pretty harsh. It's not as harsh as what Paul told Timothy. He said, an heretic after the first and second admonition reject he went on further and he says if somebody shows up at your door and they don't believe Jesus is God don't even give them a glass of water don't even bid them Godspeed everybody still with me Pharaoh said who is the Lord that I should obey his voice he's the savior of all men number three let me hurry this, this Lord that the Pharaoh was questioning that he didn't know. He's the creator of all men. He's the savior of all men. And one day, number three, this Lord's going to be the judge of all men. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Well, he's the judge. He's the one that every person that's ever breathed there is going to stand before and give an account. There's two different judgments. There's one for the believer we call it the judgment seat of Christ. Every child of God will give an account of himself to God, Paul said. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. Romans 14, 10 through 12, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That's Romans 14, 10 through 12. Hebrews 9, 27 says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, after this, the judgment. There's a group of people over in the east believe in reincarnation. They believe you live and die and you come back again as something else. There's only one problem with that. The Bible says it's appointed the man wants to die. Wants to die. You don't you don't get around to. You don't get a mulligan. You don't get to hit the reset button like you do on a, on a video game. When it says game over, the game is over. And this Lord that Pharaoh was questioning was the same one he was going to stand before one day. And the judgment for the saints of God is the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. And then there's a judgment for the unbelievers. It's called the great white throne judgment. In Revelation chapter number 20, the, John said, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. One of these days, Pharaoh, who stood there, a little cheeky grin, stood there with his little scepter and his little robe and his, and his crown as the Pharaoh of Egypt and looked at the man of God and said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I know not the Lord, neither will I let thy people. That, that same Pharaoh one day is going to stand before a thrice holy God at the great white throne judgment and he will be judged according to his works. I wish I had the time to read more verses in Revelation, but I can't think of anything more fearful than standing before a God that went out of his way to reveal himself to me so I would know about him and know what he wants and know what he said. And my only response is, who does he think he is? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? The Bible says the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written. Oh, what a terrible verse. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 
the judgment one day for the child of God the good news is we can't lose our salvation it'll be a judgment of loss of rewards or the issuing of rewards our sin was already judged at Calvary boy I'm so thankful for that I'm not gonna have to stand before God and be judged for my sin he took that judgment on Calvary but for the unbeliever you're gonna stand before God one day naked with no defense and hear him say apart from me I never knew you there may be someone here this morning maybe you haven't said it verbally who is the Lord that I should obey his voice but every time we disobey him in essence that's what we're saying every time we hear the gospel message as an unbeliever and we do not accept Christ as our Savior and we walk out the door lost condemned without God in essence we're saying who is the Lord that I should obey his voice as a child of God God help me never to look at my Heavenly Father and say who is the Lord that I should obey his voice well we studied that this morning in first Corinthians chapter number six know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost you're not your own but you're bought with the price that price was the blood of Jesus Christ so what he said in Acts chapter number 20 he purchased the church with his own blood I belong to him God help me never in my heart or in my attitude or by my actions ever look at the God of heaven and say who is the Lord that I should obey his voice heads are bowed this morning I want to